know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Endgame, Volume 1, The Problem of Civilization, and Volume 2, Resistance, by Derek Jensen, Seven Stories Press, 2006. The key ideas of this text are, one, to critique the corporate, capitalist, neoliberal, industrialized, imperialist, western, whatever you want to call it, destruction of the environment, and to promote dismantling the infrastructure and institutions which are destroying the environment. And two, to critique pacifism and to promote a variety of tactics. Although the text has a lot of through lines, such as bringing down civilization, part one, two, three, and four, and pacifism, part one through four, the text is often very non-linear, with various articles on various topics peppered throughout the text, not only as chapters, but even mid-chapter disjointed non-sequiturs, which is interesting for such a jumbled beast of a text that it's 931 pages long. But we're not going to cover each chapter like I typically do, instead we're going to skip around a bit. Now, unfortunately, disclaimer before we get into the text proper. The author, Derek Jensen, has been criticized for transphobia. It seems strange to me, like, a lot of anti-civilization, anarcho-primitivist type folks admire traditional cultures, and are against Western cultural imperialism. And, well, for all of human history, many traditional cultures have had multiple genders, so I don't see why this is even an issue. My one contention being that some anti-civ and prim folks suggest using soy products as a substitute for hormone replacement therapy because advanced medical science is part of civilization and therefore destroying the planet and bad and must be stopped. But come on, how anti-science are you that you think soy replaces HRT? What are you, Paul Joseph Watson or something? But I digress. Basically, Jensen was a member of a radical environmentalist group that I guess had espoused some transphobic shit. I wasn't sure of Derek Jensen's stance or involvement with the transphobia since all the lectures and books of his that I've seen never said anything about trans people or transgenderism in general. Then I saw a video on YouTube of Derek Jensen complaining about a high school athlete who was beating records and who was trans female and he was using this as an analog for explaining how our capitalist culture is so deceptive and degenerate and distorted that people can literally look at a trans female athlete and believe that that is normal. Basically, yikes. So, first let me direct you folks to this wonderful video by Essence of Thought, which totally debunks this transphobic BS regarding people in sports who are transgender. And if you don't wish to support Derek Jensen because of this ignorant transphobic remark, I, I totally understand that. Buy his books used like I did, or pirate them, or hell, don't get them at all. That's totally your prerogative. I suppose if nothing else, it leads to an interesting discussion about separating an artist from their work. I first read this text almost 10 years ago, long before hearing about Jensen's involvement with this group that had engaged in transphobia and before hearing Jensen make any remarks on the issue. Some folks argue that there's enough authors and information out there that we can ditch authors with troubling opinions and not really lose out on much. Other folks make the argument that death of the author, the text exists on its own and can be critiqued on its own merits. As far as my personal stance goes, I'm not interested in giving any money to Derek Jensen and I am waiting to hear him explain that he's come to his senses regarding transness and transphobia. In regards to this video, I'm simply here to look at this specific text in regards to the coming neoliberal, corporate, industrialized, capitalist, imperialist, ecological collapse and our possible resistance to it. With all that said, let's take a look at the text in depth. First off, the text begins with a list of 20 premises, most if not all of which can be covered in this lecture on the text. Some of my favorite premises are premise 3, our way of living, industrial civilization, is based on, requires, and would collapse very quickly without persistent and widespread violence. 
premise five, the property of those higher on the hierarchy is more valuable than the lives of those below. Premise eight, the needs of the natural world are more important than the needs of the economic system. And premise 15, love does not imply pacifism. Okay, let's get into the text proper. Volume one, the problem of civilization. To sort of lay out the viewpoint of the text, let me read this long section from the very beginning. Jensen states, Do you believe that our culture will undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living? For the last several years, I've taken to asking people this question, at talks and rallies, in libraries, on buses, in airplanes, at the grocery store, the hardware store, everywhere. The answers range from emphatic no's to laughter. No one answers in the affirmative. One fellow at one talk did raise his hand, and when everyone looked at him, he dropped his hand, then said sheepishly, Oh, voluntary? No, of course not. My next question, how will this understanding that this culture will not voluntarily stop destroying the natural world, eliminating indigenous cultures, exploiting the poor, and killing those who resist, shift our strategy and tactics? The answer, nobody knows, because we never talk about it. We're too busy pretending that the culture will undergo a magical transformation. This book is about that shift in strategy and in tactics. In regard to the third premise that our way of living industrial civilization is based on violence, Jensen states, Imagine if every day newspapers carried an account of each child who starves to death because cities take the resources on which the child's traditional community has forever depended. She never ran, the article might read, because she never had the energy, but she loved to be tickled and loved to watch her mother no matter what her mother did. When her mother carried her in a sling on her back, her large eyes took in every detail of her surroundings. She loved to smile at her neighbors and smile also at little birds that landed on the ground near her mother's feet. Imagine if we considered her life as valuable as the life of the efficient executive, and if we considered violence against her to be as heinous as we considered violence against him. Basically, the argument here is that you, a person who probably lives in a first world country and I assume has an internet connection, might look around you and say, what violence? I don't see any violence. But such a claim seems very silly if you are female or trans or a person of color. And the claim seems even sillier if you live in one of the heavily exploited, heavily policed ghettos or barrios in the first and second world. And so on. The more exploited you are by capitalism, the more ridiculous it is to claim that the current system is not based on violence. Discussing this flow of violence, Jensen states, I wrote a book about the violence that took place within my family when I was a child. The violence was rigidly one way. My father beat his wife and children with impunity. I remember the only time my brother defended himself by returning a single blow, he received the worst beating of his miserable childhood. Why? Because he had broken a fundamental, unstated rule of our family and of civilization. Violence flows in only one direction. We see this in the world around us. A policeman shoots an unarmed black man with impunity. Could he have shot a white Wall Street baker with such impunity? Of course not. Could we shoot the policeman with such impunity? Of course not. Maybe the Wall Street banker could. Hell, if the violence was something like people dying of a dangerous consumer product or a chemical spill, the perpetrator would likely come out of the situation a richer man. But I suppose that's the point, isn't it? Then Jensen analyzes the aspects of an abuser in a personal relationship and applies those aspects to society as a whole. Things like jealousy, blaming others, rigid sex roles, and the use of force during an argument. This is followed by large sections of various CIA torture manuals. Discussing the need to bring down civilization, Jensen argues, Bringing down civilization, first and foremost, consists of liberating ourselves by driving the colonizers out of our own hearts and minds. Bringing down civilization then consists of actions arising from that liberation. Bringing down civilization is not about being morally pure. Bringing down civilization 
is millions of different actions performed by millions of different people in millions of different places in millions of different circumstances. But do we need hope for change? Authors like Chris Hedges argue that we need to have hope. Hope even if it seems like things won't work out. And that we derive our strength from a sense of hope. Like, oh, the, the postmodernists were too cynical and we need a return to hope. A return to grand ideals. But Jensen doesn't feel this way. His stance is, The more I understand hope, the more I realize that instead of hope being a comfort, that all along it deserved to be in the box with the plagues, sorrow, and mischief. That it serves the needs of those in power as surely as a belief in a distant heaven. Hope is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. And so, to have hope is to give up agency. Basically, Jensen equates hope with the common phrase, thoughts and prayers. That we need more than wanting the right thing, we need to make the right thing happen. We don't need hope, we need action. Before we totally wrap up Volume 1, I'm going to have Derek Jensen read out part from Volume 1 that I rather enjoy. Um, I don't know if you know this, but um, the original draft of the movie Star Wars was not written by uh, Lucas. The original draft was written by environmentalists, and it's, it's a little bit different. The whole thing it wasn't actually called Star Wars. It was called Star Nonviolent Civil Disobedience. But the plot of Star Wars, for those of you who don't remember, is that the Empire has created this, this giant machine called the Death Star. And it's a machine that's capable of destroying entire planets. In the movie, the rebels find a way to destroy the Death Star. And then at the very end, Luke Skywalker uses the Force to get past all the TIE fighters and to drop a, a torpedo down a thermal exhaust port and to blow up the Death Star. Once again, the first draft of the movie, written by environmentalists, was, was a bit different. The rebels didn't actually blow up the Death Star. Instead, they used other methods to slow the intergalactic march of empire. For example, they um, set up programs for people and planets about to be destroyed to produce luxury items like hemp hacky sacks and gourmet coffee for sale to inhabitants of the Death Star. Audience members will also discover that there are plans afoot to encourage loads of troopers and other citizens of the empire to take eco-tours of doomed planets. Their purpose will be to show to one and all that these planets are economically important to the empire and so should not be destroyed. In a surprise move that will get viewers to the edges of their seats, other groups of rebels file a lawsuit against the empire, attempting to show the environmental impact statement that Darth Vader is required to file failed to adequately support his decision that blowing up the planet would cause no significant impact. Viewers will thrill to learn plans to boycott items produced by corporations that have Darth Vader on the board of directors. And they'll leap to their feet in theaters worldwide when they see bags full of letters written directly to Mr. Vader himself, asking that he please not blow up any more planets. Now, we all know that would be enough not only to bring the Empire to its knees, but to make a damn fine and exciting movie. The thing is, there's more. Thousands of renegade rebels, unhappy with what they perceive as toady on the part of mainstream rebels, decide in a scene guaranteed to bring tears to even the eyes of the most cold-hearted theatergoers to stand on planets about to be destroyed, link arms, and sing Give Peace a Chance. They send DVDs of that to Darth Vader and his boss, the Grand Moff Parkin, to whom they also send wave after wave of loving kindness. A few of the rebels sneak aboard the desk and they lock themselves down to various pieces of equipment, and stirring debates are held on screen as to whether the rebels should voluntarily surrender on approach of the troopers or whether they should remain locked down to the end. <laughs> And in a brilliant and brave touch of authenticity, the rebels are never able to come to consensus. But there's more. Once inside the Death Star, there's a splinter group breaks off. They burn a couple of transporters, and they etch Galaxy Liberation Front. And then another group breaks off from that group, and they finally make it to Darth Vader's private room. And when they get there, they sneak up behind him, and they hit him with a vegan cream pie. And the, the directors decided to cut that because it was way too close to a scene in another movie they were developing at the same time called The Plot to Pie Hitler. As the Death Star looms directly overhead, a few of the rebels advocate picking up weapons to fight back. And those rebels are generally shouted down by the pacifist rebels, who argue that attacking those who run the Death Star is just another example of the Empire's harmful philosophy coming in by the back door. If we want to change Darth Vader, they say, we must first become that change ourselves. To change Darth Vader's heart, we must first change our own. We must, above all else, have compassion for Darth Vader, and remember that he, too, was once a child. So finally, Lulu, Khan, Chewbacca, and a couple of robots show up, and they tell these others they found a way to blow up the whole Death Star. And the rest of the rebels, of course, are just horrified. There's a scuffle breaks out between Lulu, Khan, Chewbacca, and the two robots on one side, and the pacifists on the other. And the pacifists chase those four from the room and from the film, which is not a big deal because they're minor characters anyway. But anyway, the way the movie ends is that the Death Star looms closer and closer, and then you see the Death Star, and then you see the planet, and then you see the Death Star, you see the planet, and then you see the Death Star, and you see the lasers start to glow this hellish red, and then you see the planet again, and they see pssst, this little light. And what that is, that's the environmental that's getting away before the planet gets blown up. And then you see the, the Death Star again, and then it blows up the planet. And then the, the final shot of the movie, which reveals what a complete triumph this was for the rebels, is a still showing an article on the lower left of page 43 of the New Empire Times that devotes a full three sentences to the destruction of the planet. So it's like, yeah, we got some press. Volume 2, Resistance. To start out on Volume 2, Jensen argues, If you are not yet convinced that the mass of Americans will never be on our side, try this. Find a person on the street. Sit next to someone on the bus. Walk into your boss's office. Go to your neighbor's house. Talk to your parents. Tell them about the article I just mentioned. 
an article about how modern capitalism is making the world uninhabitable. The article itself isn't important, just imagine he's talking about whatever is the current doomsday article, maybe the special report on global warming or the deep adaptation report or something like that. Make clear that Great Britain's chief scientist says that if we maintain our current trajectory, most of this planet will likely become uninhabitable for humans. And surely for most other mammals as well, and surely for most other creatures as well. You needn't even mention toxification of the total environment, irradiation of the total environment, biodiversity crash, or anything else. Just mention this. That's part one. Part two, ask the person, what are you going to do about this? What are you willing to do to make sure that the planet remains habitable? Part three, repeat this process with person after person after person. Now, my question for you. Do you think that those people who are not willing to take drastic action, whatever action is necessary in order to make sure the planet remains habitable, are reachable by any means? If they are not willing to fight back with all the world at stake, literally, physically, in all truth, when will they ever fight back? From here, Jensen spends some more time discussing abuse in regards to the individual and to society as a whole. He states, Abusers are not out of control. They are very much in control. When abusers are committing their atrocities, they remain acutely aware of the following questions. Am I doing something that other people could find out about so it could make me look bad? Am I doing something that could get me in legal trouble? Could I hurt myself? Am I doing anything that I myself consider too cruel, gross, or violent? In other words, whether it's an individual or society as a whole, we need to hold abusers accountable and not excuse their behavior as little uncontrollable outbursts. Jensen then discusses Artie Lang's three rules that govern abusive family dynamics, again applying these to society at large. Rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist. And rule A2 is never discuss the existence or non-existent of rules A, A1, or A2. Now, I don't know why they didn't just use rules 1, 2, and 3, or A, B, and C, but that's besides the point. This is about the unquestioned or unchallenged abuse in our lives, or in society as a whole. Why can't we talk about the possibility of calling the police on an abusive spouse? Rule A says don't. We can't. And Rule A1 says we can't talk about if or why we can't. And Rule A2 says we can't talk about why we can't talk about if and why we can't. We just can't. The abuser is beyond reproach. Why can't we hold the president accountable for war crimes? Rules A, A1, and A2. We can complain that he didn't remember the name of the soldier who died in Niger. But we can't ask why the U.S. president is allowed to have active troops stationed in a country that has never invaded the U.S. And Jensen concludes, The answer that allowed me to move past the question of whether abusers believe their lies is this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. What matters is stopping them. It doesn't matter if Trump really thinks that climate change is a lie from China or if he knows he's full of shit and doesn't care. Neither answer changes the reality that our current system must be stopped. Jensen continues, We need to bring down civilization now. We need not hesitate any longer. The planet is collapsing before our eyes and we do nothing. We hold our little protests, we make our little signs, we write our little letters and our big books, and the world burns. Volume 2 also covers Derek Jensen's arguments against pacifism, which are my favorite parts of the whole book. For the sake of time, I won't address all of them, but let's look at a few of them. Love leads to pacifism. This implies that the use of violence, even to protect a loved one, is actually a failure to love, which is obviously BS. You can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. Now, Debord argues that we can't fight alienation with alienating forms, and in this way, the saying is true. We shouldn't try to fight the system by recreating aspects of it in our resistance. But I also agree with Jensen's argument that A. We can use violence to take down the master's house. And B. If we say that violence is one of the master's tools, then we completely give up violence in its entirety in every variety to the master. This too 
is BS. The ends never justify the means. Here, Jensen's argument is similar to Saul Alinsky's in Rules for Radicals, which is that the means are always justified after the fact. Was the Boston Tea Party an act of terrorism or of righteous rebellion? Well, the success of U.S. independence decided the outcome. Next, if you use violence against an exploiter, you become like they are. And I like Jensen's framing here. He states, It is obscene to suggest that a woman who kills a man attempting to rape her becomes like a rapist. Next, the state is better at violence than us, so we shouldn't bother. To which Jensen argues that the state is a lot better at a lot of things than us. It's better at raising funds. Should we not try and raise money to advocate for change because the state could do that better? That's just ridiculous. And lastly, that violence never accomplishes anything. To which Jensen argues that to make such a claim is to claim that anyone who gave up their land to invaders did so willingly. Violence never accomplishes anything. That people who were enslaved did so willingly. After all, violence never accomplishes anything. That children who mine coltan under gunpoint are actually doing it for the kicks. And that people who were assaulted did so willingly. To which Jensen argues, Violence is dreadfully, dreadfully effective. That's why they use it. Okay, I'm trying to make this a relatively short review, which is difficult with an over 900 page text, so I'm gonna conclude with a final reading from Derek Jensen himself. A very long quote, but I think it's a very important one. Unless it's stopped, the dominant culture will kill everything on the planet, or at least everything it can. Each Holocaust is unique. The destruction of European Jewry didn't look like the destruction of the American Indians. It couldn't because the technologies involved weren't the same, the targets weren't the same, and the perpetrators weren't the same. They shared motivations in certain aspects of their socialization, to be sure, but they weren't the same. Similarly, the slaughter of Armenians and Kurds by Turks didn't and doesn't look like the slaughter of Vietnamese by Americans. And just as similarly, the Holocaust of the 21st century won't, and do not already, look like the great Holocaust of the 20th. They can't because society has progressed. And every Holocaust looks different depending on the class to which the observer belongs. The capital H Holocaust looked far different to high-ranking Nazi officials and to executives of large corporations, both of whose primary so social concerns would have been how to maximize production and control, that is, how to most effectively exploit human and non-human resources, than it did to good Germans. The Holocaust looked different to good Germans than it did to those who resisted, whose main concerns may have been how to bring down the system. And it looked different to those who resisted than it did to those who were considered untermenschen, whose main concerns may have been staying alive, or failing that, dying with dignity. Manifest Destiny looked different to Indians than it did to J.P. Morgan. American slavery looked different to slaves than it did to those whose comforts and elegancies were based on slavery. What will the great Holocaust of the 21st century look like? It depends on where you stand. Look around. If you're in Group 1, your postmodern Holocaust will be at most barely visible and at least a price you're willing to pay, as Madame Albright said about killing Iraqi children. The Holocaust will probably share similarities with other Holocausts as you attempt to maximize production, and as when necessary, you attempt to eradicate dissent. This means the Holocaust will look like a booming economy beset by shifting problems that somehow always keep you from ever reaching the promised land. The Holocaust will look like numbers on ledgers. It will look like technical problems to be solved, whether those problems are increasing your access to necessary resources, dealing with global warming, calming unrest in the streets, or figuring out what to do about too many unproductive people on land you know you could put to better use. The Holocaust will look like houses with gates, limousines with bulletproof glass, and a military budget that can never stop increasing. It will feel like economics. It will feel like progress. It'll feel like technological innovation. It'll feel like civilization. It'll feel like the way things are. If you're in the second group, you'll continue to be co-opted into supporting a system that doesn't serve you well. Perhaps a Holocaust will look like a new car. Perhaps it'll look like eating a bar of chocolate. I believe that 60% of the chocolate in the world is tainted by slavery. I think it's 60%. Perhaps it'll look like lending your talents to a major corporation, or more broadly toward economic production, so you can make a better life for your children. Perhaps it'll look like working as an engineer for Shell or on an assembly line for GM. Maybe it'll look like basing a person's value on her or his employability or productivity. Maybe it'll feel like continuing to do a job you hate and that requires so little of your humanity because no matter how you try, you never can seem to catch up. If you're in the subsection of the third group who might someday resist but don't know where to put your rage, the Holocaust might look like armed robbery, auto theft, assault. It might look like joining a gang. It might look like needle tracks down the insides of your arms might smell like the bitter vinegary stench of tar heroin. Maybe it smells minty strong like menthol, like the sweet smell of crack brought into your neighborhood at the behest of the CIA. 
or maybe not. Maybe it's the unmistakable smell of the inside of a cop car and a vision through that rear window of a little girl eating an ice cream cone with the knowledge that never in your life will you see that side again. Maybe it looks like Pelican Bay or Marion or San Quentin or Leavenworth, or maybe it feels like a bullet in the back of the head and leaves you lying on the streets of New York City, Cincinnati, Seattle, Oakland, LA, Atlanta, Baltimore, DC. If you remember the subsection of group three already working against the centralization of power, against the system, then maybe from your perspective, the Holocaust looks like rows of black cloud armored policemen that smells like tear gas. Maybe it looks like lobbying a Congress you know has never served you. Maybe it looks like the destruction of place after wild place and feels like an impotent sharp as a broken leg. Maybe it looks like staring down the barrel of an American-made gun in the hands of a Colombian man wearing American-made camel fatigues knowing that your life is over. For those of the fourth class, the simply extra, maybe it looks like the view from just outside the chain link fence surrounding a chemical refinery, maybe it smells like Cancer Alley. Maybe it looks like children with leukemia, children with cancer of the spine, children with birth defects. Maybe it feels like the grinding ache of hunger that's been your closest companion since you were born. Maybe it looks like the death of your daughter from starvation, the death of your son from diphtheria. Or maybe it feels like nothing. Maybe it sounds like nothing looks like nothing. What does it feel like to be struck by a missile in the middle of the night? A missile traveling faster than the speed of sound? A missile launched a thousand miles away? Maybe it feels like salmon battering themselves against dams, monkeys locked in steel cages, polar bears starving on a dwindling ice cap, hogs confined in crates so small they cannot stand, trees falling to the chainsaw, rivers poisoned, whales, deaf whales deafened by sonic blasts. Maybe it feels like the crack of tibia under the unforgiving jaws of a leg called trap. Maybe it looks like the destruction of the planet's life support systems. Maybe it looks like the final conversion of the living to the dead. As much as I cannot help but see the similarities between prisons and concentration camps, it seems to me a grave error to count on Zy Zyklon B dispensing showers to mark the new holocaust. Perhaps the new holocaust is docks and polar bear fat met on sodium in the Smith River. Perhaps it comes in the form of decreasing numbers of corporations controlling increasing portions of our food supply, until as now three huge corporations control more than 80% of the beef market and seven corporations control more than 90% of the grain market. Perhaps it comes in the form of these corporations and the governments which provide the muscle for them, deciding who eats and who doesn't. Perhaps it comes in the form of so much starvation we cannot count the dead. Perhaps it comes in the form of all of these and many others I couldn't name even if I were able to predict. But this I know. The pattern has been of increasing efficiency in the destruction and increasing abstraction. Andrew Jackson himself took the scalps of the Indians he murdered. Heinrich Himmler nearly fainted when a hundred Jews were shot in front of him, which was one reason for the increased use of gas. Now, of course, it can all be done by economics. And this I know too. No matter what form it takes, most of us won't notice it. Those who notice will pay too little attention. We will follow the rules laid down by Noah and his remaining sons. We will walk backward to not see our father's nakedness. It doesn't matter how great the cost to others, nor even to ourselves, we will soldier on. We will, ourselves, walk quietly, meekly, into whatever form the gas chambers take, if only we're allowed to believe their bathrooms. <coughs> Conclusion. Okay, so industrial civilization is killing the planet, and will likely kill us all. And ensuring the planet remains habitable is more important than any economic system. Now, as I've said before, a lot of the claims for drastic destruction of infrastructure for the sake of the environment will likely cause A, many folks to go hard into the reactionary right in response and b that such activities will likely disproportionately harm already marginalized groups despite what environmental gains such destruction would bring if you want a look at modern industrialized neoliberal capitalist society's destruction of the environment and our possible response to it from a anti-civilization perspective then i'd recommend derek jensen's work he also has several lectures and speeches available for free right here on youtube the ones I find most worthwhile are Endgame, of course based off this very text, and The Other Side of Darkness, which I believe came out before Endgame, as well as his speech at the Occupy movement. I suppose I'll throw those in the description below. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the Radical Reviewer. Thanks for watching.
We plant trees. Humans tear them up. The forest does not come back. If we kill the humans, we will save the forest.